And amen. It's great to see you today. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Welcome folks online. And um, another week we have uh, some folks that uh, you guys are from Oregon and have come here today. And uh, Kyle and Mary, right? And uh, a part of our online folks. And um, word on the street is you want to move here. So, so come on. So come on. And uh, speaking of uh, folks that have watched online for about 14 months, welcome Randy and Susie Longnecker. You, you moved back here yesterday, right? Yes, yes, we did. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, all right. If you haven't met Randy yet, get ready. All right. Yeah, it'll be good. It'll be good. Thank you, Lord. It'll be good. It'll be good. I'm not talking about Randy. I'm talking about Jesus. I'm talking about Jesus. Once you taste and see the goodness of the Lord, He'll do amazing things. I want to talk to you about, um, I want to begin a new series of thoughts, and um, I didn't quite get to preach last night, but I want to share with you today about the glory. What is, what is it He calls us to be a house of glory? The, the house of glory is where the weightiness of God shows up. And you just sense the weightiness of his presence. In the, in the weightiness of God, he makes all things new. I'm going to be in the book of Habakkuk, or excuse me, the book of, that's following Habakkuk, Haggai. If you find Habakkuk, go right. And uh, I'm going to be in that book momentarily. But he wants his house to be a house of glory. He said he wants his house to be a house of glory. Amen. By the way, he wants your house. Good to see you, Marshall. He wants your house to be a house of glory. Your home. He wants your home to be a place where his spirit resides because if his spirit of God doesn't reside there, you'll have discord. He wants every house to be a house of glory. The word glory means weightiness. I've been studying um, in preparation for a series that we're going to do called House of Glory. And I want to talk about some of the things that are facing us as a congregation. And um, because there are some things that are going to face us and some challenges we'll know. And I, I, I've been working on this message for actually the series of, for about six months not knowing when I was going to give it. I was ready to give it. Uh, and the Lord said uh, nine weeks ago, no, I want you to teach on the Beatitudes. And uh, so we spent nine weeks talking about attitudes that change everything. But in Haggai, uh, it's interesting. There is several books. I've been studying four of them together. I've been studying Ezra, uh, Nehemiah, Haggai, and Zechariah. Those books are all, I know Nehemiah and Ezra are earlier in your Bible. They really probably should be later because Ezra and Nehemiah is about 500 years before the coming of Jesus. And um, they're also contemporaries of the book of Malachi, which we know was 400 years before Jesus, and the book of Esther, which is also in that, in that period of time. And he's calling the church, he's calling the people of God. Remember in Daniel, they had been in exile for 70 years. How many of you know if you move back home after 70 years, the neighborhood changed? Yes. Okay, so they're moving, they're moving back home and the neighborhood has changed. And the Lord says to Ezra, I want you to rebuild the temple. And he says to Nehemiah, I want you to rebuild the walls around the temple. I'm going to teach you next week that they tried to rebuild the walls for 70 years. 
But Nehemiah, under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, did it in 53 days. I mean, you know, you can do what's impossible when you do it in the power of the Holy Spirit and do it pretty quickly. So the people had gotten discouraged. I'm going to talk to you about Haggai chapter two, chapter 1. I'm going to tell you the story, and then I'm going to read in chapter 2. They had gotten so discouraged that they started focusing only on themselves. And the Lord said, it's time to rebuild my house. And he says, you've only been worrying about your houses with the paneling on them. And you've only worried about getting your house made right. And he said, it's time that you do not leave the house of the Lord in desolation. But you address my house because my house is going to be the house that I, I want, to, want to work on. And the Lord said through Haggai, go up to the mountains and get timber and come and build my house so that I can have pleasure in, in my house. And Zerubbabel, who was the governor, and jo- Joshua, not the Joshua in the Old Testament earlier, but a Joshua who was the priest, um, began getting stirred up for the things of the Lord. And I want to pick it up with verse 4 of Haggai chapter 2. But now, take courage, Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Take courage. I'm in the New American Standard this morning. Take courage also, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. And all of you people of the land, take courage, declares the Lord. And work. Somebody say, and work. And work. For I am with you, says the Lord of hosts. As for the promise, which I made when you come out of Egypt. Let me teach you something real quick about a promise. Whenever God makes a promise to a church or makes a promise to a people or makes a promise to you, that promise will always be accompanied by the Holy Spirit. Because He never makes a promise or gives you a command that He doesn't give you the ability to do. He never says go do something that's impossible unless He gives you the authority, the power, and the anointing to go do. So as for the promise which I made when you came out of Egypt. My spirit, he says, is abiding in your midst. Do not fear. Let's say that again. My spirit is abiding in your midst. Do not fear. For thus says the Lord of hosts, once more in a little while, I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth and the sea also and the dry land. And I will shake all the nations, and they will come with the wealth of all the nations. And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord. Somebody say, I'll fill this house with glory. glory. Let me just stop and tell you a story real quick on verse 7. I've been praying verse 7 for a while. And all the nations will come. And uh, with the wealth of all the nations, and I will fill this house of glory. There is a, um, a bishop that I haven't met named James in Cameroon, Africa, who was brutalized for his faith. And there, being brutalized for his faith, he has uh, some handicap. He um, was in Sheridan a couple weeks ago and has friends in Buffalo. And um, he went out on our property, a bishop from Cameroon, and prayed over the property that God would do a mighty anointing in Grace Fellowship and on that property. And he also said, oh, that I could have something like this for the glory of God in Cameroon. Well, let's pray for that right now. Father, I pray for Bishop James. I pray that you'll do a mighty work in Cameroon through him and through his ministry. I pray protection from further persecution. And I thank you that I I haven't met him, but he set foot on the property this 
two weeks ago. And I, I keep seeing that you're fulfilling your promise and you are doing exceedingly abundantly above all we could think, hope, or ask for according to your power that's at work within us. And all God's people say, Amen. come on, isn't that crazy? Yeah. I mean, put your hands together and give God praise. And I will shake all the nations, and they will come. Buffalo's a strategic place. I mean, um, we had some folks from New Hampshire two weeks ago, Saturday night. They said we had no idea. Your cousin, no idea that this was such an oasis and uh, that God was up to such strategic things in Wyoming. By the way, yes, he is. And then in verse 8, he says, the silver is mine. And the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. By the way, the silver is his and the gold is his no matter whose pocket it's in. Amen. This got, you guys didn't get that here. The gold is his and the silver is his no matter whose pocket it's in. Verse 9, the latter glory of this house will be greater than the former. The Lord of hosts, in this place I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. Amen. He always wants his house to be a house of glory. We see that in the Old Testament. Look at the t place of the tent of meeting, Exodus 40. Verse 34, then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and read it with me. Read it again. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord. The weightiness of God always wants to show up. By the way, in this series, I'm going to be talking to you about the difference between Christianity and kingdom, because we have made kingdom something it isn't through Christianity in modern days. And we've called things that are not different names. So he wants his glory to show up. Look at 1 Kings after Solomon is dedicating the temple. When the priests withdrew from the holy place, the cloud filled the temple of the Lord and the priests could not perform their service because of the cloud for the glory of the Lord filled his temple. Say that with me. The glory of the Lord filled his temple. Ezekiel is writing about it. Verse chapter 43, the glory of the Lord entered the temple through the gate facing east. Then the Spirit lifted me up and brought me into the inner court, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. He always wants His house to be a house of glory. Amen. This house, your house, the next house, every house, house of glory. In Jesus' name, our house. Now let me teach you a few things, five things. The first one is simply this. The enemy always fights against the house of glory. He always fights against the house of glory. He wants us to be religious and go through the motions. By the way, if you always know what's going to happen every time you come to church, then we're religious and programmatic, but he doesn't want a church to be programmatic. Not that we will never have programs. He wants it to be a place of presence. Amen. Where his presence can always be relevant, real, moving, so that He can set us free from every addiction, from every pain, from every degree of unbelief, so that He can set us free in Jesus' name for the kingdom of God. And so in Ezra chapter 4, we see, I'm, I'm going to be jumping between Ezra, Haggai, and Zechariah today. Ezra chapter 4, then the peoples around them set out to discourage. Did I mention the neighborhood had changed? and the people of Judah to make them afraid to go on building. They bribed officials to work against them and frustrate their plans during the entire reign of Cyrus, king of Persia, down to the reign of Darius, king of Persia. Thus the work on the house of God in Jerusalem came to a standstill until the second reign, second year in the reign of Darius, king of Persia. The people started building the house and they built the foundation but they got discouraged and didn't do anything for 16 years. For 16 years, they got afraid. During that 
period of 16 years, they only started focusing on themselves, which brings us to number two, discouragement. Discouraging times will always take you to get your eyes off the Lord and onto other things. We see in Haggai chapter 1, this is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say, the time has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. But the word of the Lord came through Haggai, the prophet. It is time, is it time for yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains in ruin? Now give, now this is what the Lord Almighty says, give careful thought to your ways. Now, it's not saying there's anything wrong with a nice house. I live in a nice house. Most of us do. But there is something wrong if we only focus and be selfish and never focus on the house of the Lord and what God wants to do. In fact, over the years, we've been really gifted. We go get a new couch and we give the dirty old one to the youth group. (laughs) Man, I hate dirty old couches coming into a church. You know, we always give the Lord our worst, not our best, and He's not pleased with that. He says, you're desecrating my house by that kind of thinking. There's nothing wrong with it. Living, living, living well. You should. I pray He does that in you. But there is something wrong in not caring about the house of the Lord. And so He's calling us, he's calling us to that. By the way, um, this is an interesting season. I want, to, um, I want to do full alert today. Grace Fellowship is being watched. We flew under the radar for quite a while, but we're being watched. We're being watched for our testimony. We're being watched to see when God will move, how God will move. I want to really encourage you that you're on candid camera right now, and so, and, and so am I. It may be a praise the Lord, but it's an exercise care church. Because I want, to, I want to exhort you to watch what you say. In fact, during this season, none of us here should ever speak ill of another church in this town. Yes. Because God is working in many groups. Let me say that again. None of us here should ever be speaking ill of another church in this town. It was crazy on Friday night. We had um, this uh, dinner thing, and uh, it was really cool. What was really cool is I didn't know half the people there. There were over 200 people there, and I didn't know 100 of them. In fact, I hadn't even seen some of them. Some of them I had seen in, around Buffalo, but others I had never seen. It was really interesting. Some of them heard somebody talking about their church. And they about left. That is not to be. That is not to be. Ever. That's an exhortation from me to you. That is never to be. By the way, online, you shouldn't be talking about other churches in your town either. All of us have enough we got to handle ourselves without messing with any other church. I I got all I can handle right now. Okay, say amen, it'll help you. See, discouraging, it'll turn you in on yourself and it'll cause you to talk about other people, think about other people. And I'm telling you, if it's going to be a house of glory, we think only about one and his name is Jesus. Amen. I said we only think about one, and his name is Jesus. You need to get over what's wrong with you and what's wrong with everybody else and start thinking what's right with Jesus. There's a lot to love about Jesus. There's a lot to like about Jesus. You can trust him with your life. You might as well. He gave it to you. So the work, number three, the work commenced and was completed. But it's fascinating when you read Ezra, 
how the work started again after 16 years. The work commenced and was completed as the prophets prophesied and made declarations over the, over the project. Look at Ezra chapter 6, verse 14. And the elders of the Jews were successful in building through the prophesying of Haggai the prophet and Zechariah son of Edo. They finished building according to the command of God of Israel and the decree of Cyrus, Darius, are to act... <laughs> I got, I got this. <laughs> Do not help me. Artaxerxes, whew, thank you, Jesus, king of Persia. See, you were pronouncing it wrong, too, so I didn't need your help. So, so, isn't it interesting, the elders couldn't get the job done until the prophets started prophesying. So I say to you prophet types, Matthew Schlichting in the sound booth, start prophesying, my young brother. Amen. Randy Longnecker, you prophesying types, start prophesying. Susie, start seeing. Charlie, prophesy. Gabe, see and prophesy. Start Start speaking Adam declaration over the completion of what God is going to do. Yes. Because they couldn't do it in their flesh. God, strengthen our hands. See, let me, let me, let me, let me. Well, what, listen. What did they prophesy? By the way, Haggai I was an old guy. Zechariah was a young guy. Hamlin, don't let anybody ever look down on you because you're a young guy. Okay? You have as much anointing on you as old guys can have. You just don't have all the experiences. So learn how to prophesy. What is that? It means you stir up, you build up, and you cheer up. And you do it in the name of Jesus. By the way, this church belongs to children and youth as well as adults. That girl right back there, she's got something on her. Sorry, Abby, I didn't mean to point you out. <laughs> Haggai 2, as for the promise which was made when you came out of Egypt, my spirit's abiding in your midst. Do not fear. That was the prophecy. Do not fear. Turn to somebody and prophesy over them. Do not fear right now. Just do that. Do not fear. And Zechariah, what did he prophesy? As for the promise, no, Zechariah 2.5, and my, I myself will be a wall of fire around it. He's saying, thus saith the Lord here, declares the Lord, and I will be its glory within. Let's read it together. That was Zechariah's prophecy over the temple, and I myself will be a wall of fire around it, declares the Lord, and I will be its glory within. Did I tell you that they tried to rebuild the wall for 70 years and Nehemiah did it in 53 days? Yes. Thus the completion of Zechariah's prophecy. Yes. Revelation 19.10 The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The other, the other night um, we had an elders meeting and I love this elder team who the chair is the Holy Spirit. And um, I had, we started the meeting, and um, John, you correct me if I get anything wrong here, but we started the meeting by just starting to name all of the ways since we have begun this process of relocation and building and just started praising the Lord by counting miracles. And we started naming them all. And I, I, I was building up to this verse, and I was expecting that it would take maybe uh, three or four minutes, but it went for over 15 minutes, one right after another, of just praising God for miracles. One after another, all the way from property being given to commissions not being charged and given back to 
lawyer fees not being, being given gratis to small little miracles. And I think we'll probably do that at some point as a church and just have a testimony time because the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So what He's done, we can start taking that and letting that solidify our faith that what He's done, He'll do. And because there do come times of discouragement. Um, I feel like sometimes a glutton for punishment, but um, this is the fifth building program I've been a part of. Um, I've pastored five churches and every one of them has had a building program. And in Phoenix, we had three building programs. There were th- we, it just kept growing. There were three different times. And I can tell you, having done this, and this one, um, what God is calling us to do in a place called Buffalo, Wyoming, will only get accomplished by the miracle of God. Amen. It won't be accomplished because I have experience in doing it. It won't be accomplished because we get a right contractor. It won't be experienced by any of those reasons. It'll be only experienced because God comes through. So that when it's all said and done, nobody says, man, that's a great church. I hope nobody says that's a great church. I hope nobody says that's a good pastor. I hope nobody says that's an amazing elder board. I hope everybody in this town says that's a great God. Because it isn't about us. It's about Him. In fact, a building is just the shoe for the foot to fit in. And a building is just to bring greater glory to God because He wants His house to be a house of glory. I mentioned a key point earlier, but I'll do it again. Every promise is accompanied by the Holy Spirit. One of the worst things that could ever happen here is for us not to trust in God's Holy Spirit, but for us to trust ourselves. Number number four, the Lord will somehow shake silver and gold loose from the nations to build His house so that it will be a house filled with glory. Look at it in, um, look at Haggai in the message. This is what the God of angel army said, before you know it, I will shake up the sky and earth, the ocean and the fields, and I'll shake down all the godless nations. I have no clue how God's going to do what God's going to do. I just want you to know right now, I have no plan, no strategy, no knowledge of how God's going to do what God's going to do. I do know this, the worst thing that could happen in the life of Grace Fellowship is if somebody came in and plopped all the money down that is needed, because then none of us would have to trust God like we have to trust God for what we're going to have to trust God for. And I'm praying that all of us will have some skin in the game. Because if you have no skin in the game, when it's said and done, you won't enjoy it or be grateful. By the way, I'm standing on a stage I didn't build. And I'm standing in a building I didn't build. And I think it's pretty important that we're grateful for those who went before us who had a ton of skin in the game to do it. And some of us don't understand that the lights came on this morning because somebody has some skin in the game. We don't understand. We walked upstairs because somebody worked hard to build them. And this house has been a house of glory. And it's been a place where there's been peace. And so, Lord, do it again. You know? By the way, on Saturday nights, um, 
we're having times that people are coming to the door and turning around and going out because they can't find a seat. Okay? So, Lord, help us. Lord, help us preach the gospel. See people set free. See people healed. In Jesus' name. Amen. And so we've had peace for 84 years as a church. But what concerns me is will the next generation find me faithful like the past generation was faithful? Will people who come after us when you guys are elders go, man, thank God they sacrificed. Thank God they made a difference. Because if any generation ever makes it I'm off what I was teaching today, but that's okay. We're having a conversation. (laughs) If any generation makes it about themselves, the glory won't show up in the house. And I'm going to tell you, we're experiencing some glory, but the latter glory that's coming for next generations is going to be greater than this glory. But we've got to do our part now to see it. So I don't know how he's going to do it, but I do know that he owns all the silver and gold. And we need to, what I'm really teaching you today is how to pray into things for the future. How do we pray for what's to come? How do we pray for what God wants to do? Online, guys, one of the things that I think is amazing is you are some of the leading people that are giving for a building in Buffalo, Wyoming. (laughs) You know, isn't that good? So we love you guys, but not just for that. I'm still on that song of heaven thing. There will come a day where every knee will bow before him. Well, number five, we're called not to simply build a building. We're called to build a house of glory where the Lord will grant peace. By the way, a house of glory, here's a key point, is always presence-driven, not program-based. The house of glory is always presence driven. Again, Haggai 2.5, my spirit is abiding in your midst. Do not fear, Zechariah 2.5, and I myself will be a wall of fire around it, declares the Lord, and I will be its glory within. I want to tell you something here at the end. One of the ways that we have made we have made Christianity non-kingdom is we think that Christianity is a democracy. I want to encourage everyone to pay special attention right now to the transfer of power in England. There's a lot to learn from England right now. There's a lot to learn from the transfer of power from a queen who died to a king, Charles, who's taking the throne. And we have Christianized the kingdom by thinking God's a Republican or hoping he's not a Democrat or opposite whatever party you're from. Because we want God to think like we think. And I want to tell you this morning, the kingdom of God is not a democracy. The kingdom of God is a monarchy. We talk about kingdom. There's no such thing of kingdom without a king. I said there's no such thing as a kingdom without a king. The kingdom of God doesn't have a president. The kingdom of God has a king. He's the king of glory. Will we let the king of glory in? And so I'm going to tell you, God's not an American. 
I don't know if you know that. God's not following Donald Trump. God's not following Joseph Biden. Don't say amen to one and not the other. Because this is not a democracy in the kingdom of heaven. It's a monarchy. There's, uh, I was with a pastor from Oxford a few weeks ago and he was telling me about a time he was, his dad was given an award by the queen and what that was like being in her presence. And uh, he believes she's born again and we'll see her in heaven and believes William is as well, Prince William. The stories that are coming out are pretty interesting. I love the story of the bodyguard, Richard. There was a, an American hiking somewhere near the forest of Balmoral a few years ago. And Richard, her bodyguard, was out there and they ran on to the American. And the American hiker said to Queen Elizabeth, do you know the queen? Have you met her? And Queen Elizabeth said, no, I don't believe I have. But Dick here knows her pretty well. And so the American hiker turned his attention to Dick the bodyguard and said, what, was she, what is she like? He had served her long enough that he knew that he could get away with some things. And Richard, the bodyguard, said, she's pretty cantankerous. But she has a really good sense of humor. <laughs> to which the American hiker got out his phone and handed it to Queen Elizabeth, not knowing who she was, <laughs> and said, will you take my picture with him? <laughs> and Queen Elizabeth said, well, of course. And she took a picture of the American and the bodyguard. The bodyguard quickly got the phone from Queen Elizabeth and took it himself and says, now why don't you stand with her and I'll take your picture. And he did and they handed him the phone and walked on the way. And Queen Elizabeth said, after the American walked away, I would love to be a fly on the wall when he shows that picture to his friends. <laughs> I read that story and it wrecked me. It wrecked me. Because I wonder how many times You've been in the presence and I've been in the presence of the King of Glory and wanted our picture taken with something else. Wanted our picture taken with a bodyguard when we had an opportunity to stand next to the King. So may God open your eyes that every time we come into this place or any other place, we have the opportunity to stand next to the King of glory and be forever changed and moved and His power flowing on us. Come on up, worship team. Father, I thank You for Your favor, Your blessing, how you're at work within us. I thank you for what a great God you are. I pray in these moments we'll understand that there's a King of glory that so wants to have his picture taken with us. Carrying a picture of us in his wallet. Saying, have you seen my boy? you seen my girl he celebrates you today 
He longs to be in relationship with you. He longs to, for this to be a house of glory where you'll have peace. He longs for this to be a house of glory where you're forever changed. He longs for you to be a man, a woman of the King. Wow, I can't believe how God is just moving in unprecedented ways. And he's speaking a fresh word. And I can tell that uh, the online folks are just praying for us. And uh, we just don't, we count it such a privilege to be able to come into your home and to serve you in this kind of way. Your comments, your likes, your, your words back to us, your giving when you click on give, makes such a huge difference to us. They're encouraging uh, to my own heart. I hope you just keep telling people about what's going on in Buffalo, Wyoming, because it's strategic. God's moving in unprecedented ways. And I just believe there's gonna be an anointing that travels onto every person that watches and that God's word is gonna make such a difference in your lives in the days ahead. No, we're praying for you too. And we love it that you're part of the Grace family.